for this evening, we've got uh, Chris Gilmore. I need to read the Barclays Africa Group Wealth and Investment Management, uh, which is where Chris works, otherwise previously known just as ABSA, um, but a whole lot more complicated these days. Looking at, at renewable energy, and this is, in one sense, a very exciting and hot space, we think Tesla, although I'm not sure but Tesla's still coal-fired ultimately. Um, of course, locally, we think ESCOM um, and, and, and all the, the, the worries around that, although with kudos to them, we haven't had load shedding in a bit. Uh, but I think Chris is going to take us into a lot more detail. So I'm going to park it there. Enough from me. Uh, Chris, all yours. Simon, thank you very much indeed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And as Simon said, I'm going to take you through... Um, some many and varied aspects of renewable energy. Um, the good news is that South Africa is very far down the track as far as renewable energy is concerned, far, farther, far further down the track than probably most of you realize. Um, the bad news is, as yet, and that's going to change rapidly, I think, there aren't that many avenues in which to invest, certainly not in South Africa. There are many in the US, but we'll come on to that as the, as the, as the presentation goes. But um, what I want to get across this evening is I want to start off by looking at uh, where the global renewable energy uh, field is, where we are in South Africa, and where we're likely to go from there. Okay, we're at a bit of a crossroads when it comes to global energy. You know, we've got a bit of an energy crunch. Um, we've seen the oil price coming down precipitously from this time last year, uh, half the price it was uh, a year or so ago. Uh, the Saudis and, and OPEC uh, drove the oil price down even further, and now we've got an oil price sitting around about $50 a barrel. It's looking good. Um, but as far as renewables are concerned, we're also at a bit of a crossroads. If you go back 150-odd years ago, um, most energy in the world was actually of, of, in renewable form. So, for example, ships were powered by sail, wind power. Uh, you would have grain being ground by, by water wheels, uh, you'd have horses carrying things, and then along came coal, and then oil a bit later. So you had fossil fuel combustion, with all of the attendant uh, health risks that, uh, that accompany it. Um, so now all we're doing is we're going back, if you like, the cycle has gone right round. We're coming back to renewables, albeit in a very, very different form indeed. And what is fascinating about um, renewables is that the cost of producing renewable energy has come down dramatically to the point where not only does it compete with fossil fuels, and even in South Africa, it is actually cheaper in most instances. According to uh, an organization called REN21, you can go into the website and you can Google it, renewables already accounted for 19% of global energy consumption and 22% of global energy production in 2013. And it's increasing very, very rapidly. We have to qualify this remark by the understanding that renewable energy in the form of solar and wind is not constant. So very simply, solar energy goes, goes off when the, when the sun goes down. Uh, and when, when it's not blowing uh, a wind, wind turbines don't produce electricity. So some of the figures I'm going to quote you for the, the amount of energy that are being produced uh, by renewables, you have to take with a a large dose of salt. Uh, so the rough rule of thumb is if I say we're producing 10 gigawatts of, of electricity through renewables, take about a quarter of that as being the sustainable amount that you can get at any given point in time. Many countries around the world derive an increasing proportion of their requirements from renewables. So uh, if you look at Iceland, I don't know if anyone's ever been to Iceland. I was there a few years ago, a wonderful place, I heartily recommend it. Uh, it's a 90-minute flight from Scotland. And um, you get there, there's not an awful lot to do, apart if, unless you're a, a, an avid walker, and it doesn't get um, light until, what, 11 o'clock in the morning, and it's dark again by 2.30 in the middle of winter. But they do 100% renewables, and that's a mixture of geothermal and hydro in the main. Um, they've, they've got a population of 380,000, but uh, nevertheless, you know, it's a prime example of what can happen. Germany, a much bigger... Uh, and a much more important economy, is now deriving on a sustainable basis 24% of its, its energy requirements from renewables. And that's happened in a remarkably short space of time. Uh, they got a bit of a kickstart in that. They got a bit of a fright you know, with the Fukushima disaster in um, the aftermath of the 2011, I think it was, tsunami in Japan, when the, those nuclear reactors took a bit of a pounding. 
And the Germans, who up until that point had been very much uh, on the nuclear path, decided they, they had to get very big into renewables. Denmark, about 50%. Spain, I think, is about 40%. Another phenomenon that has come into play in, in recent years, particularly in Europe and America, is the phenomenon of what we call prosumers. In other words, you've got consumers who are producing electricity. Now, I'm going to use the example of Scotland. This is a country that doesn't, um, that's where I come from originally, as you can probably tell from my accent. Um, you don't get a lot of sunlight there. That's maybe why I'm not that tall. Um, who, was, who was the gentleman who said that when I came in there? Right, okay. Um, you know, you don't get a lot of sunlight there, and yet, you go up into the northern part of Scotland, and you see so many houses that have got these huge arrays, maybe 16, 17 uh, square metres of, um, of uh, solar panels on there, and you'd be surprised at the amount of electricity that it produces. The British government, albeit they're, they're downgrading this, um, this initiative, but for many years now, they've actually paid people to sell their, their, their surplus electricity into the grid. Now, if you go into to the USA, the southern states particularly, you'll see that uh, there's a lot more of that. And in South Africa, we've been Johnny-come-latelys in this regard, but more and more houses are starting to put these on their roofs. So these consumers are producing electricity and in many instances are selling them back into the grid. Uh, in the UK, uh, you can go to your utility company, and there's many of them there because it was privatized many, many years ago, and you can do a deal whereby you can get the array fitted on your roof, and they will, they will actually pay for it uh, over a 25-year period, so you end up getting effectively free electricity. There's a think tank in the US called the Rocky Mountain Institute. Yes, it really is called the Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, they, they talk about what's called grid defection. Now that, in simple terms, means consumers going away from uh, getting their, their, their electricity from a utility, like Eskimo in this country, and producing it and using it themselves. And they reckon that by the year 2030, now that's only 15 years from now, you're going to see not a single con uh, house in the southern states of, the, of America being on the grid. In other words, deriving their electricity from the utility company. It's all going to produ be produced um, on their roofs, and it's going to be stored in the kind of batteries that Simon was alluding to earlier uh, by companies such as Tesla. Battery technology, and we'll come on to that in a moment, is, is moving at a, at a very, very rapid pace. So while in the UK and Europe and many parts of the States, the, the consumers are, are producing electricity for their own requirements as they go along, they're not necessarily using it with, in, in terms of batteries for, for later in the day. They just use it as a kind of backup. But the battery side of things will come into play as well as years progress. As far as, um, there's an interesting article in Bloomberg, and you, this, this came out a few months ago. You can go and, and, and Google this one. They've identified six paradigm shifts as far as um, renewable energy uh, is concerned. Solar power prices are plummeting. Uh, so thin films for uh, the use of, uh, it's, it's mainly selenium and a couple of other uh, chemicals that go in there. And the Chinese particularly have been producing this, these much, much more cheaply. The price is coming down dramatically. That's having a significant impact. Um, the investment in uh, renewable energy is rising exponentially. And I mentioned before we even kicked off here uh, what's happening in South Africa. If you look at the kind of uh, investment that's taking place here, and sometimes I wonder when government talks about the huge amount of money that's being spent in infrastructure in this country, they may well be alluding, at least in part, to the huge investment that's taking place in renewable energy. We're talking billions and billions of rands here. It really is vast. Uh, and, we're, and it's mainly coming through the private sector. Very rarely are you seeing governments getting involved. Decentralization. Something I didn't talk to in the very first slide uh, is energy security. And then this talks to centralization as well. Currently, you've got, we have a situation where um, energy power, if you like, I'm not mixing my, my words up here, um, is concentrated in the Middle East and in countries like Russia, for example, not necessarily the most stable parts of the world. Whereas when it comes to renewables, that is spread all over the world uh, in varying degrees. Obviously, in countries like South Africa, where you get a huge amount of sunshine, or in countries like Denmark, where you get an awful lot of wind, they've got more than their fair share. But nevertheless, uh, renewables has a great attraction because of the fact that it is distributed and you're not, you're not being um, held ransom, held to ransom, if you like, by some of these countries where fossil fuel power is, is concentrated. Also, as far as decentralization is concerned, renewables 
tend to be used in a situation where the renewable plant is very close to where the consumers are. Now, a concept I'm going to come back to not in, 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 a, in a little in a few more slides is that of um, heat and um, and sound and energy loss that is produced in high voltage cables. So. The model we have here in South Africa, and has been for many, many decades with ESCOM, is that uh, electricity is produced up in Mpumalanga and in, in areas like that, and tends to be distributed down to, to Durban and Cape Town and, uh, and other parts of the country by high voltage cables. And on a long stretch, you can lose 25% of the power. All you have to do, if you don't believe me, is stand, we'll stand under one of these things and, and just listen, and you can actually hear them humming. And it's not the wind blowing through it. It's actually a kind of energy loss that's taking place there. So there's massive energy loss. Decentralization is taking place. It's easier, it's better, and renewables really fit the bill. Global electricity demand, believe it or not, is actually declining as, as plant becomes more and more efficient. Natural gas is what we'd, the, the bag we'd put this into is alternative energy rather than renewable energy. So companies like Renergen, and we'll come on to that later in the, in the, um, the presentation, um, are getting more and more into things like gas. Now, we haven't really embraced gas uh, in South Africa. One of my colleagues at Absa Capital um, a few years ago, a few years ago um, uh, what's his name, Peter Worthington, made the interesting observation. He said, look, we could, if we wanted to, we could actually solve this uh, electricity crisis we have in South Africa by placing four or five gas-powered power plants on the Eastern Cape, getting the, um, the, the gas coming in either from Mozambique or from Mosgas or wherever, because gas at this point in time is relatively cheap. And we could, we could really overcome this, and you could build these within 18 months, but we've decided not to. But natural gas is booming, particularly in the United States, but again, Bloomberg sees that boom as only being relatively temporary. And here's the big thing, I suppose. Renewables uh, don't produce uh, uh, pollution. They are, by definition, clean. And I thought I would wear a green tie to, to tonight just to, um, to celebrate that. So climate change is a dangerous reality. And um, I think the, the, the drought that we're experiencing, albeit uh, caused, I think, by El Nino, may well have its roots in climate change. So I think you know, the sooner we, we embrace uh, renewable energy, the better. This is just a little graphic that shows the kind of uh, different types of, um, of renewable energy that uh, typically are out there. So on the top left, we've got biomass. Now, biomass, um, and we'll see it in a moment, is, is quite varied. Uh, but it, in very simple terms, it means burning organic materials to, to, to gain energy. Solar, obviously, I think we're all pretty familiar with that. Geothermal, we've noted in places like Iceland, in uh, places like Italy, in the US particularly. Wind power. And in South Africa, we've got some, some pretty chunky examples of wind power. And water. And water isn't just hydro. There's quite a few other aspects of water as well. So if we look at, um, at South Africa particularly, obviously dominated by ESCOM, we've got a total installed capacity of approximately 43 billion, sorry, 43, I always get this wrong, 43 gigawatts, 43,000 megawatts of electricity. Most of that is produced internally, and most of it's produced by large coal-fired power stations. There's a little bit comes out of Kuburg and nuclear, about 1,800, 1 1.8 gigawatts. And we get about another uh, 1.5 gigawatts from Kahorabasa in, in Mozambique. And Eskom, for many years, many decades, has been focused on these large-scale coal-powered stations. Nuclear, although there's a lot of talk about it, I think is really a bit of a pipe dream. I don't think it's, it's, it's really going to come to fruition. A lot of people... Uh, talk about nuclear as being clean. Well, it's nothing of the kind. In terms of its operational, uh, of its operations, yes, it's clean. It doesn't pollute the atmosphere. However, again, I just go back to places like Fukushima and uh, Nine Mile Island, Three Mile Island, uh, and the big one, of course, Chernobyl. You know, when these explode, they produce massive amounts of radiation, and it really isn't funny. So that's why I say it's not clean. The private sector, and we'll come onto that in a moment, is really at the vanguard of all of this. It's not government that's doing it. The private sector is putting an awful lot of money into this. And it's estimated that by the end of this year, we'll have 5,500 megawatts of, of installed capacity of renewable energy. 
Bear, what I, bear in mind what I said a few moments ago, that you've got to take that figure and probably divide through, you've got, you've got to divide it um, by four to get the, the sustainable uh, energy that we can produce. We also have to remember that because our grid is so fragile, uh, it's not just our production that's fragile, our grid is fragile, and it can't absorb an awful lot of that energy. The DTI, Department of Trade and Industry, has got a target of 20% of demand uh, coming from renewables by 2020. And I don't think that's that ambitious. I think, I think that, can, that can be done. And we'll come on to the REAP program now. Renewable energy, independent power producer procurement. Wow, it's quite a mouthful. It's a bit like Barclays Africa, isn't it? And um, this, was, this initiative was set up in, in 2012 by the Department of Energy, and it's actually been remarkably successful. Um, up until then, they looked at a variety of other methods of, of trying to get um, the, the private sector to come to the party, mainly by using things that are called feed-in tariffs. And it didn't really work, and many people actually questioned the legality of this. But REAP, in terms of its tender um, aspect from the private sector, has worked incredibly well. And if you look at the literature, um, there are many organizations around the world that actually highlight South Africa as being one of the best examples of how to, of how to do uh, renewable energy anywhere in the world. Grid defection by suburbs. Um, many of you will be familiar with what's going on in Parkhurst. Parkhurst, uh, a couple of years ago, defected as far as uh, broadband was concerned. They started putting in um, uh, fiber optics into the, into the, the, uh, the suburb. And that was remarkably successful. You've got uh, very high speeds going in there. And uh, what they've decided to do now is, is replicate that, but as far as, um, as power is concerned, and, and renewable energy. So we're going to see solar energy there. There's, there's talk about having a kind of um, biofuels system going in there as well and a landfill site. So there's a lot of things taking place as far as suburbs are concerned. You know, it's going to happen gradually, but I think more and more that will become the order of the day. There is, however... One big implication um, of gr this grid defection by suburbs, particularly by households, and that is in South Africa, municipalities derive a lot of their income from being a secondary uh, producer of electricity to consumers. Eskom produces it, sells it into the municipality, and the municipality on sells it onto consumers, and they take a bit of a turn. So if you see wide-scale embracing of... Um, of solar energy by consumers, it's going to have a detrimental impact on municipalities. So I think government is going to have to look at that very, very closely if we start seeing um, <coughs> renewable energy at a consumer level really taking off. OK, let's go look at biomass. Um, I have this, I've divided this really into ethanol, landfill gas, um, and organic material combustion. Ethanol, and I don't know if anyone's ever visited Brazil. I've been there a couple of times and seen it. It's, uh, it's quite incredible. The, the, the Brazilians have um, they've been developing uh, ethanol um, over the past, what, 30, 40 years now. They've perfected it in what they call flex fuel engines. You can, move, you can use anything from 0 to 100% of ethanol mixed with, with oil. Um, and depending on where the oil price is, whether it's cheap or expensive, you, you just vary the, the mixture of ethanol in there. Brazil is a huge uh, sugar producer. Uh, and it's a very efficient uh, uh, sugar producer. So they're able to get huge quantities of ethanol from, from sugar production and use that. Um, there's a place in Finland, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, called Oy Alhomans. Um, it's basically a wood company, and they produce about 550 megawatts. That is a, a very chunky figure using bark, you know, the, the waste products from the tree. Um, Landfill gas, and you can see it in places like Alexandra. You know, you see the, 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 the dump trucks coming in, putting it in, sand going on top, and you see little flares coming off from time to time. Only problem you've got with landfill gas, and there's some big ones uh, in, uh, in California, is that you get a lot of water vapor in there, and that messes up the whole situation. It makes it less useful than natural gas. Um, sugar companies, and that's where South Africa comes into the situation, you get uh, some of the sugar companies uh, who have been very proactive in this regard, companies like uh, Tongart and Ilova. They take what's called the tops and the tails, the bagasse, the rubbish that's left over from the, the sugar production, and you burn it in their, um, in their plants and you produce electricity. So in many instances, both here and in other parts of, uh, of Africa, these sugar companies have been able to, to utilize this and actually get off the grid completely. 
So again, there's, there's been quite, a, quite a, a rapid movement there. Wind, it really is highly variable. Um, you know, you only have to go past one of these big turbines on a, on a, on a still day to see that, uh, you know, you have to have a steady supply of wind. And in many parts of the country, you can find that in South Africa and, and, and elsewhere. One of the strange things about the greenies is that um, they don't like these. Although they, I, I find them quite, quite nice. I think they're quite elegant. But um, yeah, I think a lot of them see them as being intrusive. You know, they, they're a little bit noisy when you get close to them, and they think they're a bit ugly. Well, be that as it may, they've taken off in many, many parts of the world, offshore and onshore. Uh, they do take up an awful lot of space. Uh, the biggest one is a place called Horse Hollow in Texas, where, yes, that figure is correct, they produce 7,812 megawatts uh, of, of electricity. Now, that's a phenomenal amount. Okay, divide by four to get a sustainable uh, amount. But it, even that, that is a huge figure. And I shudder to think of the, the space that it takes up. Variable output, batteries are essential uh, to, to actually make sure that this thing works in a sustainable fashion. Solar, and obviously this is where we really strike a, a chord in, in South Africa, because this is the preferred form of energy as far as we're concerned. There's an area in the Northern Cape called the Solar Corridor, and if you look at it, it's kind of elliptical uh, shape, where the sun really beats down with a vengeance. Uh, we have salt pans and this type of thing. And it really is absolutely a wonderful place to have, um, to have uh, solar farms. The biggest one is, is called Jasper, it's near Kimberley, 96 megawatts, and that's, that's pretty chunky. Cost $2.9 billion to build. It's all from the private sector. It's got a 20-year lifespan. And $12 million of that funding came from Google. Um, now, Simon Brown will be able to tell you all about Google. Uh, that's a, it's a phenomenally varied tech company. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't just do search engines. It's into things like producing driverless cars and, and glasses and all sorts of things. But not a lot of people know that they're into this, this kind of area as well. The biggest proposed one is in a place called Sambar Lake in Jaipur in India, where they're looking to put in 4,000 megawatts. Now, again, that is going to be absolutely massive. India is a big country, so there's lots of space. Uh, and the sun does beat down uh, relentlessly. Four billion dollars worth. Currently, the biggest one in Topaz in San Luis Obispo, that's just off uh, Highway 1 in California, 580 megawatts. Again, 2.5 billion. And the largest in Africa isn't as yet in South Africa, although I think it will be in a couple of years' time. It's in Ghana, producing 155 megawatts. Okay, so I'm throwing all these numbers at you. Bear in mind, you've got to take these with a bit of a pinch of salt. Um, the sun does go down at night, um, and you can't, you can't get uh, sunshine uh, during the evening. But um, where, where, where you can get it during the day, it does produce some prodigious amounts of electricity. Geothermal, as I say, Iceland, US, Italy. Um, what happens is you get geothermal energy heating up um, water. It drives turbines. It's, 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 not, it's not particularly novel. It's just uh, that if you've got free energy. Well, it's, it's free for as long as the Earth has got um, geothermal energy. Iceland, believe it or not, and David Cameron, the, uh, the British Prime Minister, was in Iceland a couple of weeks ago negotiating a deal whereby the Icelanders are going to supply... Um, electricity to the UK via 750-mile um, cable under the sea. Now, that sounds pretty ambitious, and uh, a lot of his detractors, Cameron's detractors, are saying, well, why are you doing this? You should be concentrating on homegrown uh, electricity. Hydro is fascinating, particularly in an African context. Um, and we've divided it up into about, what, four different types. You've got hydro power, which is a dam with um, water behind it, and we'll, we'll show you a couple of representations of that in a moment. You've got a tidal barrage, Basically, that's where you put uh, a barrier across uh, an estuary as the water comes in and goes out. You get turbines moving. You get tidal turbines, which are similar. And you get wave power, where you get cylinders bobbing up and down on the, on the waves. They all produce electricity. Um, we have to also distinguish here between hydropower production and what Eskom is mainly into. They do have a couple of small hydro plants but what we call pump storage systems. The biggest one they're involved in at present is a thing called the Ngula pump storage system in, in the Drakensberg, and that is going to be fantastic. That'll come on stream hopefully next year, at worst by 2017, and that will be able to produce uh, approximately 1,000 megawatts of badly needed electricity when, um, at, 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 at peak times. So basically what happens is um, it doesn't actually produce any extra electricity, but when you've got off-peak 
uh, times you just pump water back up into the dam, and then when you need it again, it comes down through the turbines. So it's taken a long time to produce it, but it will be a fantastic thing when it's finished. Tidal barrage, as I say, you put a, 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 a barrier across the, um, an estuary. They do it in the Severn in the UK and also in France. Wave power, um, they've been talking about doing this in the Pentland Firth in Scotland, which is a, it's got a huge swell, so I was, I was up there last year. And when you're on these boats, uh, these big boats, you can actually feel the swell. It's fantastic. So what you do is you take these turbines, you put them under water, and as the, the swells go back and forth, they turn them. And then tidal turbines, uh, um, Ireland and, and South Korea. This is just a quick representation um, of how uh, hydropower works. And on the left-hand side there, you can see what used to happen in the old days uh, when you had um, pre-industrial revolution um, uh, hydroelectric power. You'd get water turning a wheel. Today, it's a bit more sophisticated. Uh, there you have the dam wall, you have the water behind, it comes through and it produces electricity through the turbines. And here's just some of the biggest hydro schemes in the world. The biggest one currently is Three Gorges in China and that produces, yes, it's that, that figure is correct, 22,500 megawatts of electricity. That is almost half, in fact, it's more than half of South Africa's total production. That's coming out of one hydro scheme in, um, in China. The Atapu system in, um, on the border of Brazil and Paraguay used to be the world's biggest, uh, 14,000. Interestingly enough, um, because of the nature of, of, of the dam, the, the Brazilian one is actually more sustainable than the Chinese one. It's to do with water levels and the like. Um, but it's, 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 the, these figures are actually phenomenal. You just go down the list there. And um, there's nothing in Africa. So, for example, Kariba, you would think would be big. It's not. It's it's big, but it's, it's it doesn't make it into the top ten. The big ones are, are in the U.S., in Brazil, in China. Um, and there are some phenomenal figures here. Just want to dwell a little bit on hydroelectric power in Africa. Um, as far as existing dams are concerned, Kariba and Kohorabasa and Upper Volta are probably the biggest. Um, Kariba is in serious serious trouble. Built in the 1960s. It's got two main problems. One is that the spillway that comes out has been progressively gouging a massive canyon um, under, and it's it started to threaten the foundations of the dam. The other problem is that the concrete of the dam in parts is swelling. Now they can, they can treat that part of it, but the, the undermining of the foundations of Kariba is, is a World Bank project, and that's, that's starting already. And they're talking about um, spending quite a few hundred million dollars on this to try and get this, the situation sorted where you have a, a clearer trajectory, a more shallow trajectory for the spillway so that it no longer um, erodes the foundations. And they're going to have to repair the foundations as well. Now, it's serious because if Kariba, which is on the Zambezi, ever burst, eight hours later, Kohorabasa, which is also on the, the, the Zambezi in Mozambique, would also burst. And you would have no um, hydropower for the whole of southern Africa. It would be an absolute catastrophe. There has been talk recently of having, um, and I've forgotten the name of the, the actual project, but it's not far from Vic, Vic, Victoria Falls, about four kilometers from Vic Falls. And the authorities in both Zambia and Zimbabwe have been warned that as far as tourists are concerned, this would be very detrimental. It would kill a lot of wildlife in the area. And I don't know how many of you have been to Vic Falls and stood on the bridge there. You know, there's a huge drop down to the, um, the water. If you actually had this thing taking place, <laughs> there wouldn't be such a huge drop. The water level would come um, uh, very, very high up indeed, and I think the bungee jumpers would have a bit of a problem. But um, these are the kind of things that the, the authorities are actually talking about. Zambia is in big trouble. It relies very heavily on, um, on uh, uh, hydropower for its electricity, and today you've got 10 hours of load shedding as being the norm in Zambia because of, of, the, of the drought. Um, Kohorabasa, we mentioned before, built in the 1970s by the Portuguese, supplies about uh, 1,500 megawatts a day uh, to South Africa. And it's a, it's a very significant supplier to here. When they took it down a, a few weeks ago for maintenance, um, you know, it was down for about a week, and um, that was problematic for us. I'm sure you've heard of Grand Inga, the Grand Inga project in, um, in the DRC. This, this project's been around since the 1970s. There are, in fact, two dams there. One built in 1972, one built in 1982. And um, the plan here, the big plan, is to produce the world's biggest hydro system, producing 40,000 megawatts of electricity. 
I think it, it'll probably remain a fight, flight of fancy for the foreseeable future for a simple reason. Remember what I said to you earlier about um, high voltage wires? Where the Congo River is in, in DRC, there aren't, the, 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 the DRC can't use that amount of electricity. So it's going to have to transmit it, pardon me, to other parts of Africa and maybe even beyond. Some people were even talking about uh, transmitting as far as southern Europe. Well, that's all very well, and you can put repeater stations in place. But the energy loss that would occur through that would be absolutely enormous. 25% on a long haul in South Africa. You can imagine the kind of distances in DRC. It's a vast country. So that's why I say you can build the plant, you can put the dams in, but getting it to where it's required, I think, could be problematic and extremely expensive. So where is uh, renewables as far as um, South Africa is concerned? Extremely limited as far as hydro is concerned. Most of our dams are pretty much... Um, muddy streams more than anything else, and a lot of them actually dry up in the summer months. Um, so it's mainly pumped storage. But some, some of the, the rivers in the Eastern Cape uh, do lend themselves to this sort of thing. So you could maybe squeeze 250 to 300 megawatts out of it at best. Solar is the biggest one, obviously. Wind power, again, maybe in, in the Western Eastern Capes. Biomass, um, we have variable appeal here, and we'll come on to that right towards the end. Uh, Sapi, Mondi, Tongat, and Ilovo, the sugar companies. Geothermal, really a non-starter. Landfill gas, limited potential. REAP, we've mentioned. Um, and again, I'm not going to, okay. Re renewable energy, independent power producer procurement. I think I've got all of them there. Yeah, okay. Um, and again, we mentioned about grid defection. Now we're going to get on to more about the, the actual potential... Um, investments that one can make into renewables. And I think that's really the, the essence of what uh, this evening is all about. Um, under Barack Obama's administration, the US government backed a number of initiatives because they believed fervently, and still do, that renewables is the future. So they pumped an awful lot of money into the system. Uh, so many companies were able to go along and get funding, and they were able to repay it at very, very favorable rates. Today, the investment landscape in America is littered with failures by um, renewable energy companies. And the most uh, glaring one is a company called Solyndra. On the face of it, it looked great. It looked wonderful, it looked absolutely fantastic. What they did is that realizing that um, so thin solar film, uh, as far as uh, photovoltaic cells is concerned, take up an awful lot of space. They built a whole series of little cylinders in, a, in, a, in, a, in an array, and you put these on your roof. And the, um, the concept was that you didn't necessarily have to have them all facing south if you were living in the northern hemisphere, or north if you're living in the southern hemisphere to catch the, the best advantage of the sun. Um, but at around about the same time, the, uh, the price of thin film started dropping dramatically, and they went out of business. They went out of business and they were owing approximately $500 million to the, uh, the government, none of which ever got repaid. So that is probably the biggest example of, um, of how not to do it as far as, uh, solar, as, as far as solar energy is concerned. Some of the other companies, and again, you can, you can Google all of these and, and have a look at them, uh, that exist in America um, are doing actually quite well. A company called BrightSource, it is an industrial scale, a uh, utility scale producer of, um, it, it, it supplies uh, componentry, shall I say, for um, utility scale production of electricity. And again, they've got a great website, go in there, have a look at it. Clean current power systems. This is a novel idea. They, this company goes into rivers and puts turbines down there, and these things roll around and they produce electricity. So again, I think it, it highlights the innovative nature of all of this. Um, end phase energy, silver spring networks, just to use a couple of examples. Once you've produced the electricity, it's all very, that, that's all very well, but that's only really where the story starts. What you've got to do over and above that is you've got to monitor it. You've got to be able to actually get that out to the consumer. You've got to be continuously monitoring what's actually happening. And these companies do that for a living. Um, Simon mentioned Tesla, uh, battery production. Um, is, is growing apace pretty much everywhere. And I think uh, that will really come into its own as, as time progresses. So 
when it comes to investment time in South Africa, and I think we'll, we'll get a lot of companies coming to the market and, um, and uh, you know, doing their thing, don't just think about the actual production side. You th you, I think you've got to think about all of the other um, uh, essential parts of the, the whole value chain that uh, renewables are, are involved in. As I said right at the beginning, I think we've got very limited opportunities within South Africa at this point in time. Uh, we've got a mixture of alternative and renewable, and by alternative, I mean things like gas, for example. Um, one of the main uh, providers of capital up to this point in time for renewable energy in the private sector have been private equity companies. And if I think of one company called Green Vantage X, um, they've been very successful in this regard. Now, at some point in time, all private equity companies have to make an exit from their, um, from their, their projects. And one of the preferred ways for all private equity companies to do it is to come to the JSC for a listing. So you can get private investors coming in there, uh, individual investors coming in there, and taking over from the, where the PE companies have left off. So I think as time moves on, and maybe not in, in the too distant future, we'll be seeing those PE companies which have had a three or four year ride already. Um, they're not going to be there forever. They're going to come to the market and will provide a mechanism for uh, investors to get into, in, into some of those big projects. Some of those companies I mentioned earlier, uh, Tongat, Elovo, um, sugar companies, and that really speaks to what I talked about with the tops and tails, the bagasse, burning them on site, uh, turning the, um, the, the, the energy that they burn into, into electricity and using it for their own devices, and anything over and above that, putting it into the national grid. Now, Eskom was very reticent uh, up until very recently in terms of taking this because Eskom, let's face it, is a, is a price maker, not a price taker. Um, and the actual electricity produced by some of these sugar companies wasn't until fairly recently that competitive. So if you're selling it into Eskom, you're going to say, well, it's going to cost you two rands a kilowatt hour or whatever, and they weren't particularly uh, keen on doing it. But now I think the, the crisis is of such proportions that they're saying, okay, guys, hold on, we'll do it. I think the very fact that Eskom has talked to the private uh, producers out there as far as REAP's concerned, again, is a tacit admission that they realize they cannot in perpetuity produce all of the power that South Africa requires, and therefore the private sector has to be embraced. Mondi, like the, the Finnish company, the craft company I mentioned earlier, and interesting enough that they do have operations in Central Europe and in, 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 um, in Finland, where they take waste uh, wood products, burn them, and turn them into um, electricity. Renergen is listed on the, and Simon, correct me if I'm wrong here, it's listed as a SPAC, a special purpose Acquisition company, there you go. So basically with Renergen, what you're doing is you're, you're putting money into a company and you're, you're having faith that it's going to uh, be able to come up with good projects in years to come. Uh, they've already put quite a bit of money into some gas projects. Uh, but if you go into their website, it's a good website, you can see the kind of things that they're talking about. It's not just alternative, it is renewable. So that's why I say I think the list will grow in future. Interestingly enough, this morning I was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I was talking to a guy called John Oliphant from uh, Gaia Infrastructure, and I think there is another example of a company that will provide um, uh, a platform, that will provide opportunities for not just um, renewable energy, but for water. So, as I was saying right at the very beginning, um, when government talks about having spent 800 million, 870 million rands on, on infrastructure in this country, and you look around and you think, well, where is it? I can't see it. I think much of it may be tied up in, in some of the things we've been talking about here. And it really depends on your definition of infrastructure and who's spending it. Is it the private sector? Is it, is it government? Um, talking to John Oliphant this morning was, was, was quite uh, illuminating, and he made the point. He said, look, and he, he, he made the point on CNBC this morning. He said, look, government just doesn't have the money at the, this point in time to spend. So I think what we're seeing is government actually embracing the, power, the, the private sector. And that, I think, in itself is very healthy and very, very refreshing indeed. As I said, not just power generating um, situation. We've got to get um, batteries in there. We've got to include that in the whole mix. And we've got to be talking about smart technology as well. 
But I think also we must learn from those US experiences. I think the fact that we have had this very responsible approach from government here in terms of embra embracing the private sector, of going the approach of the, the tender approach, um, they, they've had huge plaudits from all over the world. Um, I think they are doing it very, very well. So I don't think we're going to see this unfettered uh, system whereby you get fly-by-night operators coming in and, and failing. And I just want to end off here. I've probably only hit, hit, hit the 40 minutes sector. I don't know if I'm going to get a good beating up from, uh, from Simon for that. But uh, Ban Ki-moon, the former um, um, Secretary General of the United Nations, said, renewable energy has the ability to lift the poorest nations to new levels of prosperity. And I think that's, that's very, very true. Um, we mentioned energy security. We mentioned the fact that we're no longer going to be uh, so uh, beholden to, uh, to, power, uh, to, 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 to fossil fuel producers in places like the Middle East and Russia. And I think um, it's going to be um, very, very refreshing indeed. It's going to create an awful lot of jobs in an awful lot of countries that really need that kind of um, employment uh, opportunity. Thanks, ladies and gents, if you've got questions. Uh, Chris, one that came through in the webcast, and they were saying, you look at, at the Mondays, the Sappies, uh, York is looking to do a bit as well, York Timber and the like. In a sense, it's not that they're going to be renewable or green. For them, it's, it's an economic situation, yes. Yes. and it's going to help bring their costs down, give yes. them reliability of supply, and therefore, you know, in a more efficient, profitable company, rather yeah. than investing in green. Yeah, no, you're quite right. Um, and that's why I take you back to what Bloomberg was talking about in terms of those big paradigm shifts, shifts that they look at. And interestingly enough, they put the green thing, as important as it is, and in many ways paramount, um, it's not just about that. Uh, and I don't want to, to trivialise the green aspect at, at all, by any stretch of the imagination. Simon, you're quite right. Um, it is an economic imperative. Deviating to a certain extent, companies like Sasol are you know, using their waste gases, their, their waste energy, to produce um, electricity. Um, ArcelorMittal, same thing. It's an economic reality. Um, Eskom is in many instances not able to produce the amount of energy that is actually required. Just one thought, when Brian Molefi talked last week about um, having no load shedding until April or May, and a lot of people said, well, it's a foolhardy statement, uh, does he really mean it? Maybe he does, and maybe what we're seeing is the impact of renewable energy, dividing by four to get that figure I talked about, is starting to make an impact, coupled with the fact that economic growth isn't anywhere near where it, need, where it needs to be. But maybe what we're seeing is the demand side has now fallen back so much that they can say with a degree of confidence that there may not be load shedding until uh, April, May next year. Any questions? There was one also on the webcast about Gaia. Chris, I don't know how much you know. They're only listed on the JSE this morning. Um, they're a SPAC. I think they raised half a billion rand. And they're going to fund infrastructure in the renewable space. Um, and essentially, uh, more than anything, they're looking to give you a fairly stable inflation-linked dividend yield more than anything else. But at the moment, they sit on cash, and now they've got to go and do deals all within the, the SPAC, the Special Purpose Acquisition uh, Company rules, which, if I recall correctly, your first deal has to be half of your money and has to get approval from 50% of shareholders. Um, and they're going to be looking at the renewable space. But they're not building. They're just funding it. Yeah. Um, and then they'll give you the, the, the flows back from that. So they'll be a very boring, very stable sort of company. Uh, but boring and stable always has a place in the portfolio, I think. Um, as far as your second question is concerned, you know, you're looking at companies where you, you don't have this specific um, focus on, on green energy. And it comes back to the whole bit about they're doing it because it's, it's an economic imperative. Uh, but that is going to change. I think, um, and look, who knows when it's going to happen. We've, we've had a spate of new listings in, in the past year. Um, I think as we go into next year and the year after, I think you're going to get the, the private sector particularly, and not just in the, the producing area, is going to, to come to the market because they're going to need large amounts of money to do the kind of things that are required to, um, to be adjuncts to the whole producing side of electricity. So it, soon it won't just be the indirect way of getting um, access to it. And as I say, when I talked to Simon about it, um, you know, we, we, we said, look, um, there's nothing out there with the possible exception of Renergen uh, where you get a kind of direct uh, way into alternative stroke renewables. But I think that is definitely going to change. I think these are referred to in the industry as Southlights. 
Uh, you're quite right. They're, they're huge areas. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure I've read about that in certain parts of the world. But, again, it depends on the angle at which they're, they're, they're situated. So, so, for example, if you want to get, j j just to, to use this as in, a, in, a, in, a, in an individual consumer sense, if you want to get photovoltaic cells on your roof, um, first of all, it's ideally you should be, in, in Johannesburg, you should be facing north. And then you've got to make sure that it's facing just at the right angle. Because if you just lay it flat on your roof, it's probably not going to be the, the best thing to do. Some people have got uh, tilting mechanisms to make sure that it kind of follows the sun, that type of thing. So in a, in a typical industrial location, it might be difficult, I think, uh, in, in the first instance, to get to the, the optimal level of, um, of solar penetration there. But uh, if you can get the price of the solar panels down far enough, and as I said right at the beginning, prices are still plummeting. Um, if we can get production of solar panels up to a, a reasonable level in South Africa, where you take, where you get the uh, economies of scale and you get the prices coming down, then it doesn't matter so much. Yes, you're not going to be as efficient, but even if you're going to get 50%, you know, South Africa in terms of solar radiation is one in the top three in the world. I think maybe only Namibia and parts of Australia are, are higher. So um, almost no matter where you are, with the exception of Cape Town perhaps, uh, you know, you're going to get some great um, uh, solar capture. Makes me think of sunscreen. Um, <laughs> is a tipping point perhaps, Chris, not that when ESCOM will let us sell back into the grid? Now, I know NURSE is looking at it, the National Energy Regulator South Africa, but I look at the economics in my house, and because of the cost of batteries, it, it, my payback's all right but not great. If I can sell back to ESCOM, that immediately changes everything, and I'm calling a, a, a someone on, you know, Monday morning to come and, and, and put panels on my house. Yeah. Simon, you've hit on a very uh, important point, and many, many um, electrical utilities around the world have become quite recalcitrant in this regard. So in other words, what they're saying is, you know, we, they perceive this as a threat. Sure. And we're not talking about the municipality threat. We're talking about the producer threat. Um, so is it really in ESCOM's interest to do this? You know, if they want to remain as the single uh, largest producer in the country, uh, does it really pay them to, to encourage prosumers? Perhaps not at this point in time. If they are able to make that ideological leap and say, you know what, guys, in 20 years' time, we are going to be still a major producer, but not the only producer. Isn't it our interest to actually do this, to encourage this? It means that you don't have to get into these huge um, amounts of capital expenditure. Uh, which they frankly can't afford at this point in time because governments have to bail, having to bail them out all the time. So yes, I think it's an ideological thing more than anything else. If they can make that ideological leap, then yes, I think you will get these feed-in tariffs, which have been quite successful in many parts of the world. There's been a mixed response in, in, in some countries. Sure. No pressure, yeah. yeah. I, I would say, and again, look, I'm, I'm not passing the buck here. I'm not dodging the issue. I would say that the company that comes to the top is probably going to surprise us because it's probably going to come from absolutely nowhere. You've probably never even heard of it now. That, that type of thing. So let me give you a couple of examples in, in different fields. If you go back 20 years ago, nobody had ever, ever heard of Discovery Medical Aid. Look at it today. It's the preeminent medical aid in the country. It's got a lot of detractors, but it's got a huge amount of admirers and followers. And that is, is seen as being, you know, it was a disruptive force. And I think... Any renewable energy company, by definition, in the existing electricity landscape in South Africa is going to be a disruptive force. So you're going to get something that may even be a technology company. We mentioned earlier, Google, for example, is putting money into this type of thing. Maybe it's going to be a tech company that is going to be able to take its, its proven technology and apply it to renewable energy. It doesn't necessarily have to be in that space particularly. That's why I say coming here this evening was always going to be a tricky one because you don't have, um, and coming back to Colin's um, question, you don't have the ready-made um, uh, companies there. But I think given the pace of development, I think we may well be surprised what, what, what comes to the, the surface and where it comes from. There's yeah. someone, there's a couple, but even in the yeah. US, I mean, Solar City, um, Elon Musk involved again, um, 
doing incredibly well. And in California, again, because the, the, the state will fund it for you, um, will, will, will enable Solar City to fund your, your over a 20-year period. So basically, it doesn't cost you anything over, more, and above. Um, but it, they're at that point where the last set of results, a little bit ugly, the share got slaughtered on the market. Um, yet you know that it's going to be around and, and putting solar panels on roofs for, for decades to come in, 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 in California as, as, as they grow. Uh, question from you in the front, sir. Yeah, you know, I, I was on a, a panel on TV a couple of years ago. We had someone from, um, what's that, Green, Greenpeace? And we had a guy from the Nuclear Energy uh, Authority. And I was kind of stuck in the middle. And, <laughs> um, and it was interesting. It, he made exactly the point that you're talking about. Baseload energy is something that I think that traditional power producers see as being their domain. Because of the fact, as, as I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, sunlight goes off at night and wind is very, very variable. Um, and that's where the battery technology comes in. So if you can get battery technology efficient enough and cheap enough to allow you to have sustainable base load, and, and here we're talking, that's why the decentralization of it has to come into play here. Because you, I, I can't imagine a situation where I can't imagine batteries big enough to absorb the kind of energy that would be required from, from, from industrial scale type of um, operations there. So that's why I say decentralization is a key element of all of this. And I think that is going to be the key factor in South Africa. Um, in many other countries in the world, and Simon you know, alluded to earlier, in many other countries where you don't have a, a critical um, electricity situation, you can produce the energy, feed it back into the grid. You don't have to worry about storing it for your own, your own requirements. Here, I think it's going to be more of a, of a critical requirement that you store it uh, so that at, at, at night time you've got... And if you've got big batteries, I've seen some installations, you can power anything. You can do your geyser, you can do your ovens, you can do the works. But, I mean, it comes at a huge cost. And only when that cost comes down, and it is coming down, as, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, to more reasonable levels and more affordable levels, will it become um, a, a reasonable alternative. Yeah, the, the Tesla battery, and it, there are a couple of things about it. So there are three of them. One's for utilities. That's not us. One is for backup when the power trips. And then one is for that 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 multiple cycle. The key thing with it, instead of having 20 ugly batteries hidden somewhere, it's a pretty thing that sits on the wall. Um, it's 60,000 Rand, and it's only seven kilowatt hours, so it might get you through an evening if you don't watch too much TV. Um, then you need two, now you're at 120,000, and then your panels are cheap. I mean, compared to that, the panels cost you absolutely nothing. But uh, batteries, one of the places we really need they're doing it clever. Instead of one big uh, uh, lithium, they do hundreds of small ones, which gives a little bit of efficiency and reduces fire risk. And of course, the reduce of fire risk part <laughs> spooks me. But ladies and gents, I'm going to park it there because we've hit time. Uh, if you've got questions, I'm sure Chris will give us a few minutes. You can come and harass them. I uh, appreciate everyone's time this evening. We'll see you folks, ladies and gents, all back on 7 December. Uh, Chris, really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Cheers, all. Thank you very much. <laughs>